Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, this is, uh, my name is Jordan Love. I'm the academic uh, curator here at the Freeland Museum of Art. And um, I'm going to be um, introducing our speaker in just one minute here. Okay. All right. Uh, welcome to the Ellen Bayard Waden Lecture Series in the Arts of Asia. Um, on behalf of the Fralin, we're delighted that you could join us for this special lecture. This series, which is underwritten by the Ellen Bayard Whedon Foundation, fosters an understanding of the rich artistic traditions of India, China, Japan, and all of Asians, regions, and cultures. I'd like to extend my personal thanks to the Pollock family for their generous longstanding support of this endeavor. As the university looks to its third century renewing its commitment to fostering the education of global citizens, it is of course critical that we engage with the important histories of Asia, as well as the contemporary stories unfolding there so that meaningful engagement can be facilitated. Tonight, it is my honor to introduce Robert De Caroli, the professor of South and Southeast Asian art history at George Mason University. He is a specialist in the early history of Buddhism and has conducted field work in India, Sri Lanka, and Southeast Asia. His first book, Haunting the Buddha, Indian Popular Religions and the Formation of Buddhism, was published by Oxford University Press in 2004. And his second book, Image Problems, the Origin and Development of the Buddha's Image in Early South Asia, was published by the University of Washington in 2015. More recently, he co-authored the Encountering the Buddha, Art and Practice Across Asia exhibition at the Sackler Gallery at the Smithsonian Institution. He is also author of several articles and book chapters. He has been awarded a Getty Research Institute Fellowship and is currently a Robert N. H. Ho Family Foundation Research Fellow. Thank you, Professor De Caroli, for joining us virtually. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, everyone, for making the time to attend. Uh, thank you for uh, to Dr. Love, and I know the professors Wong and Enbaum were active behind the scenes as well. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me back as part of the Whedon Lecture Series. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I think at this point I'm going to switch over to my screen. Uh, and hopefully this will go smoothly. Let's see. All right. How's that? Perfect. All right, excellent. So um, it's a little weird. Uh, I guess my only regret is that I can't be there in person to see everyone. Uh, it is a bit strange to be sitting in my house wearing a jacket and tie, but um, we're gonna make the best of this. Uh, and I look forward to your questions uh, when the talk is over. Uh, our topic today is uh, making the Buddha, the origins of Buddhist, uh, sorry, the creation of the Buddha's image in early South Asia. Now, when discussing art, scholars and artists often speak of art for art's sake. Yet I'm really doubtful that any such thing does or can actually exist. No object can be divorced from the cultural context in which it resides. And such con concepts normalize and privilege just one way of understanding objects. And we risk being blinded to their social functions. So for example, the designation art often carries with it certain connotations that stem from a culturally specific, now primarily post-Renaissance European, notions of exhibition and status. As such, a work of art is generally intended to function as an object of display that reflects favorably upon the individual or the institution that claims possession of it. Ideally, this ownership often reveals something about the status, wealth, and importance of the owner or owners. And within the system, of the renowned of the object's creator can frequently add considerable weight to these favorable associations. And this is particularly true if the artist happens to be well-known and respected. Although it may seem unusual to highlight this functional aspect of Western art, it is important to recognize that this is one of the primary hegemonic frameworks into which objects from around the world and across time have been made to participate through the establishment of museums and art markets. 
In fact, to define the, sim the system simply as Western is to fail to recognize that artists and collectors from around the world now actively participate in this method of understanding and valuing art. With the rise of the global art market, it becomes easy to forget that not all of the objects now designated as art had similar motives underlying their creation, despite their shared current function as commodities. To make such an assumption about the origins of objects is to ignore the complex history of human interaction with material culture. If we assume all artists participated in only one way, one very particular way of understanding their creations, we artificially limit our own ability to appreciate the historical meanings associated with these objects. And we neglect to ask the questions that bring us closer to understanding the importance that they held in their original contexts. Our expectations can lead us to ask the wrong questions. And in the case of the early Buddha images, the answers to questions uh, at times reside within the broader, broader earlier norms and wider cultural understanding of art's uses and functions. One such question lies at the very heart of Buddhist art. To be specific, the issue of which I'm speaking is the question of where and when the first demonstrably verifiable image of Shakyamuni, that is to say the historical Buddha, was created. This search has been the topic of a long and ongoing discourse among scholars. And like most longstanding academic debates, this discussion has come to encompass many intricacies and given rise to numerous individual theories. This debate has generally coalesced into two primary camps. Now there are those who place the first images of Shakyamuni, uh, that is to say the Buddha, in the, in the Northwestern regions of Gandhara, which occupy parts of modern day Pakistan and Afghanistan and those who placed it within the Mathura region, which is located in North Central India. Naturally, this is a vast oversimplification of a very complex debate, but it is still useful to have this sort of schematic from which to begin. The implications of this dispute went well beyond the questions of where the first Buddha image was made and immediately became wrapped up in issues of cultural pride. At stake were the very origins of the South Asian figural art tradition and the entire legacy of Buddhist imagery. Originator and influence became highly loaded categories laden with no notions of cultural authority and dominance. It's also more than a little significant that this debate over the origins, over, over origins was born in a moment of flagging empire and nascent nationalism. More often than not, European scholars who were enamored with neoclassicism attributed the origins of the Buddha image and by extension, the entire Indian sculptural tradition to Greek influence in Gandhara. And scholars like Ananda Kumaraswamy, who were critical of Eurocentrism, situated the earliest images in the central Indian region of Mathura. Therefore, the positioning of origins, uh, sorry, the positioning of the origins of the Buddhist imagery in either central India or further west in the Greek influenced regions of Gandhara held implications well beyond the specifics of Buddhist art. So while it would be oversimplistic to suggest that the participants in this debate selected their positions based solely on their opinions of British imperialism, politics, racial, and cultural claims were particularly powerful subtext throughout the early decades of this debate. Now, it's always been a deep irony that both of these regions, which were so intensely cosmopolitan, would have become the setting for this binary debate over influence. The links and exchanges between Mathura and Gandhara have both been long acknowledged and too often ignored. Both regions, cultural remains contain coinage and edicts that display multiple languages, present depictions of various ethnic modes of dress and contain both inscriptional and archeological evidence of trans-regional travel and trade. Perhaps most significantly, during the centuries bracketing the cusp of the common era, large portions of both regions fell under the political control of the same Central Asian dynasties ruled by the Shaka and Kushana kings. Therefore, any discussion of primacy and influence is necessarily muddied by the complexity of these regional and trans-regional dynamics. It is an interesting byproduct of late 19th and early 20th century art historical scholarship that only one aspect of this exchange, the development of the Buddha's image with a particular focus on its style has been assigned a prominence above all else. This is particularly interesting because if we look at the Buddhas from two regions, we'll notice that while the style differs, 
the iconography is identical. And that doesn't happen by accident. It suggests strongly that the artists in both regions were in communication with one another. Now, today I'd like to shift the conversation slightly. Rather than asking where and when the first Buddha images were made, I'd like to, to explore the questions of how and why they were made. I want to look at when they were embraced and when they were avoided. What were the historical and cultural factors that led to the emergence of the first Buddha images? Doing so might also shed light on some of the other issues we discussed already. It's common knowledge that for roughly the first 500 years of Buddhism, the Buddha's image appears to have been intentionally and studiously avoided. Although there exists Buddhist art dating from the early second century BCE, prior to the late first century CE, these scenes contain no actual representations of the Buddha himself. Even though the rest of the scene might be depicted in full, the figure of the Buddha is simply indicated by an absence or an appropriate symbol such as a footprint or by parasols and fly whisks over an empty throne. In a well-known example taken here from the North Gate of the Great Stupa at Sanchi, there is a scene depicting the Shakyamuni's great departure. Uh, this is the moment when he leaves the palace deciding to pursue a religious life. Now, even though all the other players in the narrative are present, Shakyamuni is never actually depicted in the scene and his presence is indicated primarily by the riderless horse, which we can see at different stages in his journey. Notice that there's an umbrella and fly whisk held over the horse, which are signs of, of kingship. And at this point, the future Buddha was a prince. If you look at the far right of the image, you'll notice that there's two footprints on the ground. These indicate the moment that he got off his horse. And you can see that the horse is now being led back to the uh, city by its right, uh, the charioteer. The fact that artists went to such lengths in order to avoid depicting the Buddha gives us some idea of the importance associated with images and indicates that they must have had a strong reason for choosing not to represent him. Because the Buddhist literature is frustratingly silent in regard to these aniconic works, it's difficult to be certain what these compelling reasons might be. However, scholarship has tended to fixate on this conspicuous absence while ignoring the broader context in which this Buddhist artwork was situated. Perhaps due to its vigorous tradition of creating visual narratives, the art of Buddhism has dominated the scholarly discourse on early South Asian aniconism. Because image making was implicitly seen as normal by later scholars, these works treated aniconism as a Buddhist anomaly. However, by not assuming that images, that image making holds the same meaning in every context, and by widening our gaze to look beyond Buddhism, we can identify other categories of figures who are also notably absent from the material record. The corpus of sculpture dating to before the first century is devoid of any depictions of living humans, including living rulers, the Vedic gods, or any sort of transcendent religious figures, such as the Jain teachers. Only after the first century CE do we see the cultural shift in which a whole new range of topics appear to have become viable as subjects for depiction. The appearance of royal portraits is perhaps the clearest expression of this, but it also included in this new repertoire are Brahmanical gods, Jain Tirthankaras, Bodhisattvas, and the Buddha himself. These figures emerge as major artistic subjects, despite the fact that all of these traditions had long histories with little or no prior custom of figural representation. The shift towards figural art is apparent in the artistic and archeological remains, but the reasons for it still require some explanation. Researchers have scoured Buddhist texts for evidence of a ban on images or signs that the Buddhists actively adopted aniconism as a policy. There is, however, very little to show for all this effort. Passages in the Buddhist textual sources that criticize the use of specific visual imagery often preface broader lessons about the shortcomings of image-based devotion. But none of these arguments ever goes so far in its criticism as to call for an outright abandonment of image use. In most cases, these objections are little more than preludes to rules that set forth guidelines for the qualified or conditional use of images. At their most strident, these polemics seek to dissuade readers from participating in image use by offering cautionary examples or by making unflattering comparisons to other preferable or more efficacious modes of worship. Although these critiques can be forceful in their claims, most authors had an eye towards compromise. 
which may be one indication of how popular images had become by the time many of these texts were written. Nevertheless, the views they express must have uh, resonated on some level because the arguments that they employ tend to show up as recurring rhetorical points identified in a range of both Buddhist and non-Buddhist texts. Now, this is not to say that no Buddhist texts or monastic codes ever placed restrictions on the use of certain images. Some rules did place explicit limitation on the types of images that could be made or that were deemed appropriate for certain contexts. The clearest examples of this are aimed at members of the Buddhist monastic community and stipulate specific restrictions on the creation or viewing of certain subject matter. To be clear, none of these restrictions refer to images of the Buddha, but they do introduce categories of visual imagery that at least some authors deem to be off limits. One such passage can be found in the Mula Sarvastavada Vinaya, as well as in the Chinese version of the Sarvastavada Vinaya. In it, the monk Nanda is feeling wistful and he begins to draw on a rock. His chosen subject matter is a depiction of the woman to whom he had been betrothed before becoming a monk. Now at this very inopportune moment, a senior monk, Mahakashapa, wanders along and seeing Nanda's artistic endeavor disapproves heartily. Now, after being informed of the situation, the Buddha proclaims a rule that no monk may create the form of living things. Now, this passage would seem to be a preemptive move to counter the more titillating aspects of figural art that may be contrary to the monastic life. And indeed, Nanda is frequently featured in monastic rules addressing how to interact with women. Likewise, the Sarvastivada Vinaya uh, contains additional rules explicitly preventing the decoration of stupas with images of, and I quote, men and women coupling. The writers of the Pali Canon apparently had similar concerns and in the Chulavaga of the Pali Vinaya Pitaka, for example, we encounter a general restriction against any representation of men or women used as decoration in monastic dwellings. In each of these cases, there's also good reason to think that public perception played a role in the formalization of these rules. It is notable that this category of living things was to various degrees singled out for disapproval in all three of the Vinayas. I mentioned this because similar categories also appear in the Brahmanical literature. And this concern over images of the living may help to reveal wider underlying concerns about figural art. At minimum, they provide a clear example of what a Buddhist ban on specific imagery looks like and highlight the fact that we have nothing like these sorts of clear restrictions aimed at images of the Buddha himself. It's possible to read the Buddhist injunction against images of the living as being inspired by the decorum demanded by the monastic life. If we look at the Brihat Samhita, however, no such restriction should apply. Uh, this work is usually dated to the sixth century and is primarily a manual on divination that offers advice on all manner of unusual portents. The text as a whole is decidedly positive on the topic of images, and it does not aspire to any transcendent religious objectives. In it, the depiction of specific imagery is designated as inappropriate for particular contexts because the mere creation of such images invites danger. So for example, the text gives us this cautionary advice, a house where figures of monsters and ghosts are drawn or a picture of the house owner is drawn will be destroyed before long. This passage groups together two unusual categories of artistic imagery. Depictions of dangerous supernatural beings would seem to fit logically with this warning, but the danger posed by the image of the homeowner is certainly less clear. A similar injunction can be found as late as the eighth century in the Chitra Sutra of the Vishnu Dharmotara Purana. This work is a treatise on painting and it sets out the legendary origins of the art form as well as providing technical guidance for artists. Among the advice it offers is a warning against portraiture in the home. And in this way, it echoes the Brihat Samhita. Specifically, it states, O King, a portrait of oneself must never be made in one's house. Now, what we have here may simply be the record of a cultural custom or idiosyncrasy related to home decorating, but 
Its concern over images of the, limit, of the living links it to earlier examples. The Sukhraniti uh, Shara, uh, which probably dates to between the 9th and 13th century, makes this point more broadly. It praises the use of divine images, but condemns the making of human figures as simply not heavenward leading. Puzzlingly, few of these rules regarding images of the living actually agree over their specifics. So it's difficult to know how to situate them in the broader context. I, I mention them here, however, because I believe that these concerns may all refer back to common origins. Images of the living are at times discouraged or described as unseemly, worldly, or even dangerous. And this critique may provide a clue as to the origins from which the anxiety about images and image use derives. I believe it's possible that these concerns over images of the living and objections to image-based forms of religious devotion may share common roots related to the way images were used in late Vedic rituals that are aimed at influencing lovers and punishing enemies. Now, to explore this idea, let's first look at examples of figural imagery, or at least references to it, that predate the first century CE. To understand the reasons why certain imagery was avoided and the circumstances that led to their eventual acceptance, we must first examine how figural art was used and understood in South Asia during the centuries before the Common Era. We must appreciate what it meant to make an image of an individual and how that object was understood to function. Therefore, it makes sense to survey a broad range of textual and archeological sources dating to before the first century CE for any evidence of something like portraiture or figural art. Now, while images of the dead seem to have followed their own sets of rules, images of the living, both human and divine, show up almost exclusively in one of two contexts. The first and most apparent of these are the imposing sculptural images of regional terrestrial deities, such as yakshas, or the female counterpart yakshis, or nagas, and their female counterparts naginis, and other categories of spirits, uh, which uh, you can see two examples of here. Such deities control regional health and fertility, or rainfall, and are therefore vital to the welfare and prosperity of those who live within their domains. Uh, these images represent the first extant examples of large-scale sculptural imagery in South Asia and date to the third or second century BCE. The images uh, from sites like Besnagar, Padliputra, uh, and Mathura are excellent examples of this sculptural type and demonstrate the typical upright posture, frontal ga gaze, and broad shoulders associated with these earliest images. Most of these works were found in locations near urban centers or villages and are approximately life size or a little smaller, uh, with the exception of the Besnagar image seen here on your left, um, which is well over three meters of, in height. I actually, um, I'm 5'11 and I come up to about the elbow. So uh, such semi-divine figures, and again, I'm calling them semi-divine because these are, are regional gods, they're terrestrial. They're the gods of the lake or of the forest of a particular crossroad or a particular village uh, rather than transcendent deities. Uh, such semi-divine beings hold power over local aspects of wealth, health, and fertility, but are almost never associated with higher transcendent or soteriological concerns. Nevertheless, the worldly matters that they oversee are of profound importance, and devotees at times honored and placated these divinities through the use of images intended to represent them. South Asian literary sources contain several tales that give us some idea about the way figural images were understood and used. Uh, for example, in the lives of the Jain elders, uh, there's a story about a yaksha statue that could be used to verify the truth. Specifically, if a liar crawled between the image's legs, the yaksha statue would crush the untruthful person, simultaneously punishing them and revealing their deception. A similar quality is attributed to images of a yaksha named Mogarapani, uh, which is referred to as truth-telling. It is possible, therefore, that the process of swearing in front of an image may have been an act of special significance, due at least in part to the fact that the images and the beings they represent were both granted a certain measure of agency. The literature attributes similar active qualities to the images of many regional deities who must be fed, tended, and otherwise appeased by their book devotees. 
Now, the previous examples were all gleaned from religious narratives, which may lead us to question how much the texts were fictionalized or to what degree they portray actual practices. Fortunately, there's another body of literature that by its very nature reflects actual or at least ideal practice. I'm speaking of texts that dictate legal and political behavior. The Arthashastra is an excellent example of this. It's a primer for kings that provides advice on governance and administration. Uh, there is some debate over the precise date of the text, but most scholars believe that it was first composed in the third century BCE, but was heavily amended and enlarged over the centuries. Uh, the version that, we, that now exists re reflects uh, the late fifth or sixth century version, but maintains portions that are much older. Regardless of its date, this text is not overtly beholden to any religious tradition, and it provides advice on a wide range of topics. At its core, uh, it promotes a rather ruthless and frequently underhanded practicality. Uh, Machiavelli has nothing on the Arthashastra. Among its more devious suggestions, the text describes a way to gain tactical advantages over opponents by using images. By means of an underground passage, agents are directed to enter spaces beneath deities uh, or in hollow deities, and from that location to make pro proclamations of doom that will drive an enemy to surrender. Alternately, as a way to draw an enemy king out, the text prescribes that agents arise, uh, arrange to make an image bleed or to speak from trees so that the rival ruler will leave the safety of his palace in order to participate in the expiatory rites and thereby render himself vulnerable. The context for these passages is remarkably different from those in the previous examples and helps to confirm the association between Im images and the supernatural. Even though the text suggests faking miraculous occurrences involving images, these tactics would logically not be effective if the general public did not deem them to at least be possible. Furthermore, even the authors of the Arthashastra seem to accept such events as possibilities because the text also contains advice on what to do if real evil spirits begin to plague one's kingdom. In fact, one of the few groups to whom the king is advised to show respect are those who are experts in the practices of magic and holy ascetics capable of counteracting divine calamities brought on by angered spirits. Now, the benefit of dealing with prescriptive texts is that we can be reasonably certain of the author's intentions. That is to say, if the purpose of the text is to provide sound advice to a king, it is unlikely that the author would introduce options that were based on intentionally fanciful or fictional information. These examples reveal a consistent tendency <clears throat> to credit images with a certain amount of agency. They are portrayed as innately forging a binding connection between the representation and that which is depicted. However, the sympathetic association between the original and its copy really shouldn't surprise us that much. Because even by the Buddha's time, this idea had been at the core of Vedic ritual practice for centuries. Given this association with ritual, it's perhaps not expected that the second context in which we find figural art intended to represent specific individuals is preserved in texts describing ritual practices. These are the rituals recorded in the later Vedic materials of the Brahmanas and the Griha Sutras. A significant number of these rites involve the use of images, and they do so almost invariably in contexts designed to influence or gain control over the individual being depicted. Punishing one's foes or attracting an object of affection is accomplished through sympathetic rites that allow things done to the image to impact the individual it depicts. So for example, uh, in the Atarva Veda, um, Parashistha, an opponent may be slain or rendered submission through the simple yet potent act of chopping his image to pieces. Uh, similarly, in the, in the Kaushika Sutra, uh, it advises that trampling on one's enemy's image is a way of achieving, achieving a comparable result. Uh, I think my favorite one though, uh, comes from the Samavidana Brahmana, which instructs the ritualist to construct, construct an effigy of the victim made of cooked grains, then to scoop out the heart and eat it. So these passages present a very specific ritual function for figural imagery. And it would seem to hold rather troubling implications for those being represented. Now, just as these techniques 
uh, can be dra dramatically effective in times of conflict, they were apparently equally useful in the pursuit of love. A wistful lover who wishes to gain favorable attention is directed to create an image of the potential lover from potter's clay and then to shoot its heart with a ritually prepared arrow. In this way, the Atarva Veda claims that the practitioners will win the affection of the individual who is both the physical and emotional target of the rite. By performing a ritual on the surrogate, the consequences were believed to transfer and manifest in the target in the original, thereby securing the person's affections. Now, given the deeply personal nature of these rituals, focused on either enmity or desire, the objects used in such rites are therefore intentionally temporary, and the rites themselves are often viewed as secretive, furtive, and often more than a little unsavory. Nevertheless, these texts do help us to understand how figural images of the living, uh, a category which apparently includes those in heaven, as well as potentially those in ambiguous states like nirvana, were understood in early South Asia. With great consistency, the use of figural images and icons is relegated to contexts which are centered on the attainment of worldly needs and desires, often at the expense of the individual being depicted. The use of images provides a way to influence or gain limited control over the actions of another. While it might be perfectly acceptable to appease or supplicate local divinities through their images, or even might be occasionally acceptable to assault a foe through his, his effigy, it becomes clear why individuals would be deeply hesitant to create images of the Vedic gods, transcendent teachers, or living kings. It also clarifies why figural depictions of living beings were so problematic in a wide variety of contexts, and why a homeowner might not want to display a portrait. The implications of a monk caught drawing a portrait of, of a woman are far more complex than they might have at first appeared. Figural art invites vulnerability and susceptibility and to potentially unwanted forces. The likeness is profoundly tied to the original and implies a connection through which one can actively engage the other. Given this cultural context, it becomes more apparent why early Buddhists might have been so deeply reluctant to depict their teacher in figural art. As an added concern, uh, the Buddha's entry into Nirvana freed him from all ties to this world. Therefore, any form of embodiment or depiction might run the risk of sending the wrong message about the finality of such a state. So what changed? If we now have a better understanding of why no Buddha images were depicted, why is it that somewhere just before the first century, we start to see his image appearing? What was it that opened the way for figural art to appear in a wide range of new and very public contexts? What changes first occur in the years spanning the cusp of the common era and are deeply entwined, uh, sorry, these changes first occur in the early years spanning the cusp of the common era and are deeply intertwined with political power and the emergence of dynasties with cultural roots originating, originating outside of South Asian cultural milieu. This acceptance of images as a means of expressing royal power may be due in part to the fact that these dynasties as foreigners did not share the same cultural understanding of images traditionally found within the subcontinent. In particular, I'm referring to the Kushan and Indo-Scythian kings who inherited a long and active tradition of public portraiture, both in stone sculpture and on coins, and who utilized figural imagery of gods and kings as a means of projecting legitimacy and authority. Notably, and as far as I can tell, in invariably, the years in which reigning kings began to display their own images publicly are the same periods in which new modes of representing religious figures were also pioneered. Put simply, depictions of the Buddha did not appear in any regions that did not also have the practice of depicting living royalty in art. The first appearance of Buddha images postdates, or at best coincides with the public use of the local king's image, a practice that, again, I'll repeat, was unknown in South Asia before the cusp of the first century and seems to have been introduced by the Shaka and Kushana kings. I am, however, by no means suggesting that this is a causal relationship. My intention is to assert that the appearance of royal portraits suggests a specific attitude towards the use of figural art as a means of establishing authority. 
This use of images to express legitimacy also ease the way for those interested in lending authority to ideological or religious perspectives through the use of art. As we've discussed, both the regions of Mathura and the Northwestern regions, sometimes referred to as Greater Gandhara, were well known as centers of artistic innovation, particularly in relation to the development of the Buddha's image. At the peak of their influence, however, these regions were also powerful Kushan political centers, and the Kushan kings were not shy about displaying their likeness on coins, stone, and just about anywhere. And Mathura in particular has produced a rich variety of archeological remains that provide a unique opportunity to study the ways in which image use developed regionally from the first through the fourth century CE. So now that we have uh, images, the new question might be, how do we know that these new images were used in religious practices? How do we know that they were used in ways associated with religious devotion? Well, image-centered devotional practices are well documented in, in the literary sources, but it can be challenging to find clear evidence of them in the material record. A possible indication of such practices, however, can be found in the honorifics used in sculptural inscriptions uh, used to address figures of veneration. The designation Bhagavata or Bhagwan, Lord or Holy One, is among the most commonly encountered titles on sculptural examples believed to be associated with devotional cults. And it's not unusual for the donors to identify themselves as devotees in the service of a particular religious figure. This ter terminology, therefore, when associated with religious art, provides us some confidence when deducing whether or not devotional modes of worship were present. Early examples of this terminology appear on images associated with regional deities. So for, for instance, in an inscription found at Jamalpur, the donors of a sculpture identify a Naga, uh, which is a serpent-like spirit associated often with water. Uh, and they identify this Naga named Dadikarna as Bhagavata. Uh, just as one of four inscriptions from, uh, this is just one of four inscriptions from Matra that honor Nagas um, with this designation. Similarly, the famous Parkam image of the Yaksha Manibhadra was donated by his congregation, and therefore they refer to this powerful Yaksha using the name, the same deferential title that we encountered in our previous example, Bhagavata. Images of these deities are among the earliest examples of figural art in South Asia and their devotees maintained image cults long before any others. So it is natural that they set the examples for the newcomers. Prior to the fourth century, five and possibly six inscriptions from around the Mathura region have been identified which refer to the Buddha as Bhagavata or utilize some variation on that honorific when referencing him. Jain examples are slightly more numerous with six extant inscriptions that refer to a jinnah as Bhagavata and uh, it is notable that these monastic communities employed the same, oh, sorry, it is notable therefore that these monastic communities employed the same terminology used by cults dedicated to regional deities. If we're correct in associating the honorific Bhagavata with devotional practice, then these examples taken collectively point to a widespread use of sculptural, a sculpture in devotional context throughout the Mathura region. The geographic proximity of these inscribed images and the frequency with which they appear suggest that the donors who left these inscriptions shared certain ideas about worship that crossed sectarian lines. The commonalities in the language and formulations used in their donations indicate that our Buddhist donors saw what they were doing as being not unlike those practices undertaken by their neighbors. In other words, the Buddhists, Jains, early Vaishnava devotees, and those dedicated to the cults of regional gods all utilized the same terminology when designating their object of devotion. The, the use of honorific titles and the ways in which the donors express their relationship to those central figures of devotion indicate shared, albeit vaguely defined, regional ideas about worship. <clears throat> Just as these um, were some, just as there was some unity among those embracing image use, we can also see that there's similarity among its critics. I'll show you that one for now. Not everyone immediately embraced the use of figural images as a positive development. These devotional inscriptions are therefore by no means indicative of the views held by everyone. 
Judging by the textual sources, many Buddhists, for example, were still deeply resistant to the use of figural imagery in religious contexts. The Maitreya Simhanada Sutra, for example, describes the body of the Buddha as inexpressible and inconceivable. An early translation of the Anguttara Nikaya boldly asserts that the body of the Buddha defies measurement and definitely cannot be made into an image. Other texts take less extreme views and permit images to be made, but only with the Buddha's direct involvement. Several early narratives, including those preserved in uh, the records of Chinese pilgrims, reinforce this point by representing situations in which the Buddha must project his shadow or become directly involved in the artistic process in order for his likeness to be copied. Certainly, it's more than a little, it's, it's more than a coincidence that these views find almost exact parallels in the Brahmanical literature. Take, for example, the philosophical school of the Purva Vimamsa. This school of thought was staunchly averse to the use of images in ritual practice. Their views on the subject came to a head in the fifth century under the writings of Shabara, who completely denied the possibility of any form of divine embodiment and argued that all references to God's bodies were entirely metaphorical. A conclusion which undercuts the efficacious nature of, of uh, image use at its root. The extreme Mimamsa reaction to images was, was at least in part a response to the position held by the Vedanta thinkers. This philosophical school, particularly the influential Advaita Vedanta branch, took a more conciliatory approach to the topic of image use. The Vedanta teachings allowed for the possibility that gods might embody themselves, but only if they desired to do so. Now, the parallels to Buddhist texts, which either deny the possibility of embodiment or um, require the Buddha's direct participation in the process, I think are fairly apparent. Now, another concept that finds parallels in multiple traditions is the idea that the use of images is for beginners or for fools, and that such practices bear few spiritual results. Uh, the Maitreya Simhanada, which according to recent scholarship, may be among the earliest of the Mahayana Buddhist sutras, builds from an attack on the efficacy of image-based practices to denigrate those who engage in such modes of worship, uh, and, and sorry, to denigrate those who engage in such modes of worship. Likewise, the Pragnaparamita literature makes it clear that honoring the Buddha's, the Buddha's body pales in comparison to the resplendent benefits earned by honoring even a tiny portion of his teachings. Uh, these texts are among the harshest in their treatment of image-based practices. Describing any who would adhere to the Buddha through form and sound as being foolish and stupid. Compare the judgments Compare the judgments that one finds in the Brahmanical literature to the Rigvedana's authors, for example, who taught that only the dull-witted and I, uh, sorry, who taught that only the dull-witted identified gods in idols. A similar characterization of image use can be found in the Yoga Vaishistha, and in, in the, Manish, the Manishmriti explicitly places priests who use images below all others. This law code, often dated to the second century, frequently denigrates devalakas or priests who attend images. According to its rules, such individuals, along with doctors and sellers of meat, are to be excluded from all rites directed to the Vedic gods or ancestors, and are therefore inferior to others who do not participate in image-based practices. There are significant similarities between the way Manu marginalizes priests who attend images and the manner in which some Buddhist texts, particularly in the Mahayana tradition, address image use among monks. It appears that some members of both the Brahmanical and the Buddhist communities shared apprehensions over the expanding role of images in South Asian religious life. The author of the Manushmiti appears desperate to preserve the role of Vedic ritual and disapproves strongly of practices that might erode their centrality. Similarly, the Mahayana uh, authors struggled to preserve older ascetic traditions in the face of new devotional practices. In this way, these conservative iconoclastic positions would seem to have more in common with each other than with many members of their own religious communities. Despite this resistance, the proponents of image use were also quite resourceful and found clever ways of including images without necessarily compromising ideological concerns. Uh, I don't have time to tell too many of them today, but I'd like to give you at least one example of this sort of um, ingenuity. 
One frequently cited passage from the monastic code of the Sarvastivada sect describes a famous and wealthy merchant named Anathapindata, asking, who asked the Buddha for permission to make an image of the time when the Buddha was a bodhisattva. In looking beyond the Sarvastivada tradition, the Mula Sarvastivadan monastic code contains another variation of this sentiment in which the merchant asks for and is given permission to make images of, the, of a specific bodhisattva, namely the one sitting in the shade of the jambu tree. This is almost certainly a reference to the first meditation undertaking, undertaken by the future Buddha while he was still a prince living in the palace, well before he attained his Buddhahood. Therefore, portions of both communities, the Sarvastavada and the Mula Sarvastavadan, uh, advocated the creation of pre-enlightenment images of the Buddha uh, from the time when he was still a bodhisattva. This practice is concern, con confirmed by a set of well-known sculptural images whose iconography matches what is typically associated with the Buddha, but whose inscriptions identify them as bodhisattvas or future Buddhas. These images have been linked to the Sarvastivada school by inscriptional evidence. And based on this connection, some authors have made the suggestion that this image type may have been a clever Sarvastivada attempt to create a likeness of the Buddha without having to address the concomitant problems of embodiment uh, that figure, -like, figure likeness would typically incur, incur. In other words, they could show an image of the Buddha without running the risks of undermining concepts of nirvana. Although various scholars have expressed this idea diff in different ways, the general argument is that these images depict the Buddha at a moment in his life prior to his enlightenment, thereby allowing him to be present in a way that does not undercut the finality of nirvana. The ingenuity of this approach to image making is not readily apparent until one takes a moment to explore Sarvastivadin concepts of time. Unlike most schools of Buddhism, who saw the Buddha's body as now absent or as having never really actually existed in the first place, the Sarvastivadins held that all actions in the past, present, and the future were real. This qualified realism may have allowed for the portrayal of the Buddha that recalled his past while not invoking him in his present totally absent state of nirvana. As John Strong put it, from the Sarvastivadin viewpoint, the Buddha may be said to, be to, may be said to exist after his part of nirvana, but entirely in the past. This brief overview of early approaches to image-based practices has presented a wide range of strategies for either adopting or conditionally rejecting images. Furthermore, the application of these strategies apparently crossed religious lines. What I hope has become clear is that it is insufficient to explore the history of South Asian image use and avoidance while ensconced within a single tradition. Ultimately, the ideas of, about concerns over and justifications for images transcend individual sectarian views and are expressive of larger concerns about the expanded use of figural art in religious contexts that face society at large. Many of these concerns appear to have centered on older conceptions of images as ritual instruments, which were solely effective in attaining worldly aims. As such, images were understood to forge powerful connections between the effigy and the individual being depicted, no matter if that subject was human or divine. When new moods, modes of public images were introduced, it took time for those ideas to gain acceptance. And debates over the appropriateness of images in South Asian religious contexts continued for centuries and, in fact, still continue today. Therefore, as significant as the emergence of the Buddha's image might have been, it must be recognized as just one artistic innovation among many. And those traditionalists or innovators who dis, uh, discussed these developments were equally or perhaps more motivated by concepts originating outside Buddhism as they were by those with concerns specific to the tradition itself. Broad studies that transgress disciplinary categories and trace discourse across religious lines are sometimes necessary for providing context and for suggesting new ways of conceptualizing communities in the ancient world. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to uh, end share screen or shall I'll I? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Oh, hang on. Uh, how do I do that is the question. Oh, here uh, we go. Cl the, click the green part along the top where it says.
Okay, let's see. Am I doing that? Okay, there I did. It. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Um, and if if there are, we'll we'll do some questions. And if uh, Robert, if you need to uh, bring your screen back up to answer questions via an image, then feel free to do so. Sure. Um, so I'll just I'll field questions so that you can concentrate on answering. Um, okay, that's fine. Our first question is from Jason, um, who wants to know, does the emergence of figural art coincide with any shift of political power? He's thinking of it, the analogy to um, the artistic style of Egypt when Akhenaten rose to power. Um, is there any historically significant events affecting the subcontinent that would lead to this shift? Uh, yes, there are. Um, rather than being an internal development, as in the case of Akhenaten, it's an external development. Um, we have new dynasties, um, the Indo-Scythians. Uh, these are, are groups coming in from Central Asia, sometime just prior to the first century, in the late first century BCE. And then when a more large scale way, the Kushan kings who come in for a longer period of time, um, both of whom have their origins in Central Asia. And so I, one of the the arguments I'm trying to make is that is that they understood images very differently than um, had been in South Asia prior to their arrival. Uh, they are very, very happy to market themselves in artwork. They put themselves all over the place. Um, typically, uh, we have examples of large scale sculptures. Obviously, that probably didn't circulate too much. Some people would have seen it, but it wouldn't have been available to everyone. Uh, but coinage is probably the most visible way in which they depicted themselves. And they had a habit of putting the king on one side of a coin and a god or other religious figure on the other, um, including images of the Buddha at times. Um, and they drew from a very, very wide range of religious figures, um, many of whom stemming from the Persian world, from India, uh, from the Greek world, uh, all of them present on their coins. And so in, in a way, uh, their coins were sort of a, a series of divine endorsements for their legitimacy. Great. Uh, once this, I'll just finish up real quick. Once that <laughs> once that happens, the South Asian kings pick it up very quickly as well. And so it's not long before we see, particularly the Satavahana kings, um, who are an indigenously Indian group, showing portraiture on coins and also making images of religious figures. Okay, great. Uh, Dorothy Wong has a question. She says to say hello and thank you for Hi, <laughs> agreeing to uh, come and speak with us today. She wants to know, does the Indian notion of darsan play any role in Buddhist imagery? And if so, when and what are some examples? So I have a theory about that. So, so darshan, um, for those who don't know, is a very key component to Hindu religious ritual. Um, it, one of the ways in which the devotee achieves a kind of connection to divine forces is through eye contact with the image. So you might see in a, in a Hindu ceremony, a, an image that's entirely decorated and covered with cloth and jewels and so on, but the eyes will always be very visible because the eyes are that, that place of connection. Um, and that idea takes off primarily um, with the arrival of puja in temple contexts in the Hindu tradition. And it takes a while for that to start up because we have a, a period of transition where the Brahmins are, are largely doing Vedic type temporary fire sacrifices. Um, and then eventually over time, it starts transitioning uh, in very complicated ways into temple-based worship. Um, that's where darshan becomes really key. Something I think happens, uh, it's not true of all of India, but it's certainly true in the Mathura region in the, say, a lot of the Gupta art that we see. As darshan becomes more prominent in Hindu contexts, we start seeing the Buddha look down. So in other words, I, I can't prove it, but I think what's going on is that our Buddhist artists do not want to give the implication or even the suggestion that you're getting darshan of the Buddha because darshan makes a connection to another entity, right? To another being. And the Buddha is supposed to be entirely gone. And so, an implication of darshan would undercut any ideas of the finality of, of nirvana. And so I think it's kind of intriguing that just as we get this sort of ramping up of uh, Hindu temple traditions, the Buddha starts to look down, making it impossible to have very clear eye contact with them. And so that, that meditative um, uh, sort of low lid, eyes with lowered lids um, is something that comes in um, later. The earliest images 
the Buddha's got wide eyes uh, staring straight ahead. So I hope that answers your question, Dorothy. Um, our museum member, Avril Somlio, would like to know, is there is this practice against the use of images related at all to similar kind of iconocla iconoclasm in the Muslim or a Jewish world? No, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think in those cases, you have very clear prescriptions against the use of images. Um, one of the frustrating things about the Buddha, Buddhist uh, world is that we, we never have that injunction, right? There's never this rule that says thou shalt not create an image of the Buddha. It's just that people didn't. And it seems to have been almost a, a more voluntary or self-imposed restriction um, that I think is stemming from these cultural norms about what images do. I mean, it's sort of unusual for us to talk about the function of images, right? We, we, we think about them as being art and they stand in museums and they look beautiful. But I really want us to think about these images as active that if you are in the presence of this image, you are in the presence of the individual that it depicts. Um, and I think that concern um, led naturally to the avoidance of certain kinds of images of certain respected figures. Uh, you could imagine, I think putting it in a, in a more mundane way, right? If the king saw that you had a picture of him or an image of him in your home, that would look pretty bad for you um, because typically those images would have been used in a way to gain influence over the person being depicted. Um, and so you could imagine if you don't want to do that to a king, well, you're probably not going to do it for the Buddha either. Um, one more question here. Um, does this rule out the Alexander the Great incursion as an influence on the Buddha images? Uh, yeah, I think, I think um, that, so for those who don't know, Alexander made it as far as the Indus and then was pulled away due to illness and died in Babylon. Um, but many of his troops remained behind. And so there, there remains a, a Greek and later Roman influence in that part of the world that, we, that I, on the map where I showed you where Gandhara was. Um, <clears throat> and so the artwork in that region is stylistically influenced by the Greek world. Um, I think it's very unlikely that the, Buddhist, the Buddha image itself arose from Greek influence um, because we have the same image um, developing in two regions. Uh, a point which I made quickly, and maybe I should reiterate, is that really the only difference between the images in Gandhara and in Mathura is their style, right? So style refers to how you represent something, but what's being depicted is identical. In fact, the, the most, I think, apparent way we can see that is in the iconography of the Buddha. In other words, the markings on the Buddha that let us know that we're looking at the Buddha. And the Buddha has in the literature a long list of unusual characteristics, uh, 30 major and 80, 32 major and 80 minor uh, lakshanas or marks on his body. And um, of those, only a handful are typically depicted. The cranial bump, the mark between the eyes, right? Uh, in fact, the, the long earlobes that he has um, aren't even parts of the lakshanas. They're just a byproduct of him being an Indian prince. And so as a prince in India, he would have worn very heavy earrings. And so to a South Asian audience, if you see a figure without heavy earrings, but with long earlobes, you know that's somebody who used to have incredible wealth, but gave it up. And so the fact that we see exactly the same iconography in Mathura that we see in Gandhara is pretty shocking. And if it were happening individually, I think the only conclusion we can draw is that those artists were in communication with one another. Right, and that these, this process was happening simultaneously as much as we can tell. I mean, I suppose somewhere, somehow there must have been a first image, um, but I, I don't think um, it was Alexander who was the, the source of that. Um, Paul would like to know, would there have been a difference in access to artists by Buddhists versus non-Buddhists um, who were commissioning works? So, that's a good question. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, we don't know much about artists, but we have looked carefully at the style of these early images. And uh, one of the things I can tell you is that the, particularly in the <clears throat> in the Mathura region, the person, the people who were sculpting the first Buddha images were very used to sculpting yakshas, which are those those very sort of powerful looking uh, local gods. Um, because if you look at those early images of the Buddha, he looks like a linebacker. He's got the same broad shoulders wide eyes, um, frontal stance, 
he's instead of holding a uh, a flask of, of medicine at his side, he's got his his robes bundled up. Um, but he's even making the same approach without fear gesture that the yakshas make. Um, so it's pretty clear that the artists in both Gandhara and in uh, Mathura are drawing on what they're familiar with, right? They're, they're being called to create this new image of a Buddha, right? Something which they've probably never seen before. Um, and in doing that, they're drawing on what's familiar to them. And so they're both being influenced in their own separate ways. Uh, that's why we think it's probably the same artists who are carving yakshas and nagas or Hindu gods or whatever are still the same ones who are also carving the Buddha images. Um, Dan Enbaum says, a great Hi, talk. <laughs> um, he says, I want to ask about monastic texts that Chopin has written about that talk about monks bringing the Buddha that is an image to a city. How does that fit in with your very interesting suggestion of a Buddhist rejection of darshan? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think what's happening there is a different kind of experience or one that would be, um, would have to be justified in a, in a different way. Um, so how do I put this? Um, there's a lot of different Buddhists and there's a lot of Buddhists who are doing different things and approaching the Buddha in different ways. Not all of them are agreeing on how it's done. Many of them are very concerned about Nirvana uh, and what images mean. As time goes on, things get more relaxed. Things get a little bit more um, familiar. And suddenly image use doesn't seem quite as shocking as it used to. And a, a lot of the texts that, that uh, Gregory Chopin's looking at are things like the Melistra Vastavad and Vinaya, um, which are a little bit later than what I'm discussing. And so time has passed. And so at that point, um, I don't think we have direct references to Darshan, but certainly the idea of a festival or a procession or using the image in a way that's um, uh, auspicious uh, comes, into, comes into focus. The Buddhists go through um, incredible backbends in order to justify actions that are simpler for other groups. The, the Jains have this problem as well because their, their teacher is absent and yet they want that figure to be present in some way for the, to empower the rituals. Um, when we have discussions of relics or stupas, the question is, is who are you honoring when you're honoring the, the relics of the Buddha, right? How are you getting benefit for that? Well, there's a whole series of different explanations. Some say that before he died, the Buddha um, set aside um, uh, miracles to help people because he knew that, these, that, that there would be sort of um, people doing good things or making offerings in the future. Others say that it's the gods, the local gods who become Buddhist. They see you do that, it pleases them, and they're the ones that reward you. Uh, other texts say that it's totally independent of the Buddha or the gods, it's just karma. If you do something good with a good intention, that intention produces fruit, which then brings good things back to you. And so different Buddhists have different ways of explaining why an image is efficacious, or why a stupa is efficacious, or why a relic is efficacious. Um, and they're not always agreeing on um, what it is that they're seeing, right? What's going on in their head when, a, when a, uh, a Buddhist from this period sees that the image could be very different from one person to the next. Um, and so again, those processions provide a really interesting example because I don't think we have descriptions of, uh, we, we're told that these images are being brought out on festival occasions. Um, probably they're done in part where, for, for the monastic community as a way to garner more support for them, to bring people in for donations. Um, but it's also clearly understood to protect or um, bring blessings to the town, right? Almost as a kind of um, talismanic function. Um, and so it's, it's, it's hard to know exactly how to reconcile that with, with concepts of nirvana. Um, Douglas Grebner, I think wanted to ask a question about the intersection of Kushan royal iconography and Buddhist art. Yeah, they borrow heavily from each other. Good point. <laughs> um, yeah, the, um, the, the, a lot of the imagery that we associate as Buddhist imagery is, is really sort of co-opted royal imagery. Um, and I, it's not just Kushan. Some of this imagery actually predates the Kushan. So the prevalence of umbrellas and fly, and fly whisks as marks of, those are early marks of kingship. We see them with the Buddha. Uh, the way that the the Buddha sits on a, on a throne uh, that's called the lion throne and, and he's often associated with lion imagery. This is also royal emblems from the time of Ashoka. 
Um, and, and the kinds of um, uh, attributes and qualities that are assigned to the Buddha are often royal, simply being co-opted into a new context. Probably the clearest example of that is the wheel. Um, this is again, not Kushan per se, it's, it's, it's Mari and it, it goes all the way back to the third century BCE. Um, but the wheel imagery is the chariot wheel. And it refers to the Chakrabartan or the, the world conquering king. The idea is that anywhere that their chariot touches the earth, they own it, right? They're that powerful. And the Buddha takes that imagery, which had been a very martial, very powerful military image and turns it into an image of the Dharma, of the teachings of the Buddha. And so his first sermon is called the turning the wheel of the law. And so he's spinning this Dharma wheel in a different kind of conquest of the earth. This would be a religious conquest. And so ever since that very early association, we see a lot of um, uh, royal imagery showing up, but with a different meaning or a slightly different meaning in, in Buddhist context. I, th I think it, they're probably intentionally keeping those early connotations. Um, but applying them in a different way. Uh, Kushan specifically, uh, it's interesting, um, the Kushan kings often sit with their legs hanging. And we also get after that time, from about the, I guess about fifth century, we start seeing images of the Buddha with his legs down, seated on a throne as well. And so there's, there's probably some inspiration that's coming in there from the way that the Kushan kings represented themselves. Awesome. Well, we have two more questions. So I think we'll, we'll use that as a wrap up. Um, uh, Anindya wants to know, did the images of Hindu gods emerge about the same time as the images of Buddha? That is what I would expect if the absence of the Buddha image in the early centuries was a cultural norm rather than a religion specific prescription. Uh, right, yeah, that's a good point too. There are some earlier examples. For, for most of the Hindu deities, it's, it's gonna come in at about the same time or later. That's where things really pick up. Um, but there are actually some earlier examples. Um, particularly, we have Im images of uh, Balaram and uh, possibly Krishna that come in quite early. Um, but again, at that point, it's not quite synthesized with Vaishnavism yet. It seems to be more of a of the hero called the Vrishni heroes and that sort of thing. So it's hard to know on the scale of sort of hero cult to divine god where where we are yet. It's at the very beginning of that process. Um, there's potentially some uh, images that may be depictions of Surya or Mitra, but again, these may have some Central Asian influences in them uh, and a few others as well. But, but for the most part, um, it, things really pick up at later periods um, and certainly they don't get institutionalized into temple forms until later times. Um, but yeah, there, there, are, there are a few. Oh, and I should mention too, terracotta mother goddesses or goddess figures, um, these often, escape the view of art historians, but they're really plentiful. And I think we do ourselves a disservice by not talking about them. Um, many of these, I think were probably related to women's devotional practices uh, and often probably tied to things like rights surrounding childbirth or pediatric concerns over the welfare and health of children. Um, but there's, there are those types of images too. Um, so again, it's, it's, uh, it's there, it's there. Um, but in most cases, it seems to be um, uh, of a smaller scale and more regional nature than we would see in other places or in later periods. Okay, uh, Dorothy Wong wants to know, in your opinion, what contributed to the decline of Buddhism in India? Before that, the parallel existence of Buddhist and Hindu images must have caused perhaps some competition? Yeah, uh, uh, it is competition. And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting byproduct of, of the Indian um, of interaction of Indian religions is that there, there is a tendency to not overtly reject the other, but to kind of include them, to bring them into the fold. And in that way, um, they gain less power or authority. Uh, and so for instance, when the Buddhists do this to the cults of the Akshas and the Nagas and so on, they bring them in and they make them protectors and guardians of the Buddhist faith. Right? Instead of being at the center of the sacred space, they're now on the periphery of the sacred space. And so there's a kind of displacement that takes place. Well, if we fast forward a bit, something similar to that happens with Buddhism, where as time goes on, um, it seems that temple-based Hinduism really gains larger uh, audiences, is getting much more attention, and the Buddhist community is becoming more marginal. 
um, it's not having the same kind of popular or royal support that it had had in earlier periods. Uh, and as a whole, the institution tends to sort of um, uh, focus on one or two regions, um, particularly the, the region in, in, the, in the Northeast around uh, Nalanda seems to have been an important center, a few others as well. And as a result, they were often um, places where, where um, wealth had been concentrated. Uh, they become very important, like sort of uh, tempting targets to be looted. Um, and after time, we start seeing Indian Buddhist monks and nuns showing up in Southeast Asia, asking for a refuge from say uh, the Burmese Kings. Uh, and so it seems that, that there is a, a gradual but persistent decline somewhere between the eighth and 12th century. Um, and in that time, we start seeing the Buddha being absorbed into Vaishnavism as one of the avatars of the god Vishnu. Uh, and many of the sacred sites that had been, say, a Buddha pada or a Buddha footprint is now the footprint of Vishnu. Uh, and there's a kind of um, uh, overlay that gets placed on them. Um, and so that the tradition eventually is sort of absorbed into and made part of Hindu tradition. All right, well, I need to wrap it up here. And But thank you so much, Robert, for, uh, Professor Crowley, Dick Crowley for um, joining us tonight and uh, being able to create our Whedon lectures virtually. We're very happy to have heard your fantastic lecture. And please keep an eye out for future Whedon lectures. Um, a lot of people are chiming in. They absolutely enjoyed it. Um, so, and they love your, um, your Garuda on your wall. Um, yeah, it is, good, good eyes. <laughs> so um, anyway, thank you so much. And uh, everyone be on the lookout for future lectures and a lot of our other virtual programming, which we have on our website. And uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we hope to have you join us in the future. Thank you, it's my pleasure. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you.